disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed, be raised up third day. I think this was daily conversation from here on out. No questions anymore about the person, but they struggle with the plan. They really struggle with the plan. The struggle was not because Jesus wasn't clear. Please notice verse 32. He was stating the matter plainly. Parasia means clearly. Here he's stating something crystal clear, unmistakable. You don't have to be a scholar to figure out what he said. It's not esoteric, mystical language. He was stating it clearly. Their confusion then comes not from his communication. But they can't accept the plan. So Peter, middle of verse 32, took him aside, huh, grabbed him. Come with me, Lord, Son of God, Messiah. Come with me. Brash? Yeah. Presumptuous? Absolutely. Drunk with privilege? Sure. Encouraged by a sense of importance from the Lord's affirmation that you received what you received from God. He is full of love and kind intentions. There's no question about the person, but he's, he's got some questions about the plan. So he, he grabs the Lord and pulls Him away. Now, if you ever question the humanity of Jesus, this is one of the greatest illustrations in the Gospels of how human Jesus was. He treated Him like a man because He was a man. Pulls Him aside. He has to give Him a better understanding of this whole Messiahship responsibility. And then it says, He began to rebuke Him. He began to rebuke Him. Wow! It's the same word used before when Jesus rebuked them or warned them not to tell anybody. Strong, strong word. He goes after Jesus, and He really takes Him on. Matthew says it this way, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. He's not asking questions. He's making statements. And idiomatically, an interesting phrase in Matthew, may God grant you better than that. Whoa! This isn't going to happen. And we're not going to allow this. Well, verse 33, turning around and seeing His disciples, <laughs> He'd been pulled away by Peter. He rebuked Peter so they could all hear. Same word again, third time it's used, strong, and said, get behind me, Satan. Whoa. First of all, Matthew says, he said, you're a stumbling block. You're in the way. You're a hindrance. Then the real blow. Get out of my sight, Satan. That's literally what it says. Get out of my sight, Satan. It's a bad idea for followers to play God. When you put yourself in the place of God, you end up putting yourself in the place of Satan. He says to him, you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. That's an indictment of Peter. P Peter, Peter didn't want the cross. These guys were looking for glory. Do we remember that Peter and uh, that James and John had come with their mother to ask if they could sit on the right and the left hand in the kingdom? I mean, it was all about elevation, glory, power, prosperity. Jesus says, you are an offense to me, according to Matthew. You're a scandalon. Scandalon means you're a trap. You're a baited trap. You're a Satan trap. You're a Satan stumbling block. If you're trying to dissuade me from the cross, you're on Satan's side. Get out of my sight. Boy, has ever a man been so high and so low so fast? Whoa! Peter and the others were caught in the narrowness of the present and uh, failed to grasp the echoes of the past prophets and the future glories of the resurrection. You're the stumbling block. If you try to stop me from the cross, which itself will be the stumbling block. Peter must have been crushed. But man's way and Satan's way is the path to glory and blessing and power without suffering, without pain. God's way is glory, blessing, power through suffering, through suffering. Peter learned. He really did. It would be good to close by looking at 1 Peter. Just a couple of comments. 1 Peter 2.21, Peter writes, You've been called for this purpose, 
since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in His steps. He suffered, and so will you. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in His mouth, verse 22. And while being reviled, He didn't revile in return. While suffering, He uttered no threats, but kept entrusting Himself to Him who judges righteously. He's writing to suffering believers who are being persecuted, and He's saying, this is the path to glory, and the model is your Savior. This is Jesus' path to glory. This is our path as well. And then verse 24 shows He understood the substitutionary atonement of Christ. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Ah, and He did now understand Isaiah 53, for He draws this final statement from it, by His wounds you are healed. So he understood the substitutionary atonement, and he understood the path to glory through suffering for even the Savior as well as for all who follow the Savior. So he says in chapter 4, verse 12, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Don't be surprised. Verse 13, to the degree you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Verse 19, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful Creator in doing what is right. Learn to suffer. It's the path. It's the path to glory. Chapter 5, verse 10, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And then here is a doxology that must have come from His own experience. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter needed to be perfected, confirmed, strengthened, and established, didn't he? And it was the path of suffering that took him there. The good news, Jesus is Messiah, the Son of God. The bad news, He's going to die. The good news, He's going to rise. And the really good news is called the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again for the salvation of all who believe in Him. You're listening to John MacArthur, president of the Master's College and Seminary, as he explained the greatest news of all, the gospel. His lesson today is a part of a brand new study on Grace to You titled, The People Who Can't See Christ. Uh, John, the spiritual sight uh, you've talked about,